Well, we're in this series called 50 Days of Hope, and we're talking about the 50 days between the resurrection of Jesus, he was here for 40 days, then ascended back to heaven, and then those 10 days before the Holy Spirit came and the church started. So that's 50 days, and we've been talking about the events that happened during those 50 days, and that's our series title called 50 Days of Hope. We believe that the things that Jesus did in that time of waiting were incredibly important for us even today. Last week, we talked about what God does when he makes us wait, how he helps us through waiting. Nobody likes to wait, but oftentimes it's in the waiting that we find the breakthrough. So today, what we want to talk about that Jesus did for his disciples during that time of waiting, one of the reasons that Jesus waited for 40 days before he went back to heaven was this. He wanted to help his disciples believe. You say, well, that's crazy. They were with him for three and a half years. They saw the, um, the crucifixion. They saw the resurrection. Why did they not believe? Well, we're going to read about that a little bit today. And before you get too hard on them, let's just kind of give them a break because you and I probably, if we were in that circumstance, would have difficulty believing as well. And so one of the things that Jesus did for them was to help them believe. And you say, why is that so important? Well, because it is the one thing, faith is the one thing that you cannot do without in your Christian life. It is the most important thing in your Christian life. You say, where do you get that from? Well, Hebrews chapter 11 tells us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. In other words, it's not more difficult it's not harder to please God. It's not that there are more barriers if you don't have faith. He said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. I really do believe that's why the devil, the enemy, will work overtime to cause you to doubt. He will call it work overtime it, through your circumstances, through your pain, through the difficulties that you face to cause you to doubt because he knows that is the one thing that can either lead you to victory, the kind of life that God wants for you, the kind of life that God blesses, the kind of life that overcomes, or between that and complete failure, complete defeat. God says it's impossible to please God without faith. So today we're going to talk about how Jesus met um, and appeared to his disciples and we're going to refer to them as the 11. Now, we know that there were originally 12 disciples, 12, uh, and, and one was reduced by Judas, remember, after he betrayed Jesus, he went out and hanged himself. So uh, that number at that time was 11. We read in the book of Acts, uh, after the starting of the church, there was another one added, and it was always referred to as the 12 after that. So when it refers to 11, the 11, we're talking about those apostles that lived with Jesus for three and a half years while he was here on earth. So let's begin reading in Mark chapter 16. I'm going to read a lot of scripture today uh, to point out how Jesus helped them to believe. And I want to show you three things that Jesus tried to help the disciples to believe. And I believe those three things he wants us to believe as well. Mark chapter 16, verse 9, it says, Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. And she went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, I want you to notice this theme. These are the apostles, the one that, ones that started the church, the ones that took the gospel around the world in a short time, changed the world, the ones that gave their life because of Jesus. Here's what it says about them. They did not believe. They did not believe. And after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it to the rest. But they did not believe them either. And later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe. Now, these are the people that witnessed the risen Christ. 
They were with Jesus on this earth. They saw him raise dead people back to life. They saw him take five loaves and two fish and and, and feed 5,000 men, not including the children. They saw him bring uh, deaf people to be able to hear, blind people to be able to see. And they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Then Luke chapter 24, verses 9 through 11. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men. These are the men that Jesus said, I'm going to be put to death and I'm going to raise back to life again. The one that had done all these miracles in front of them, they said it sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe. Now you get the theme here? They did not believe. So I want to show you what Jesus wanted the disciples to believe And I believe what he wants us to believe as well. Now, there are a lot of things he wants us to believe, but three things from these verses that we read today that I want to show you what God wants you to have your faith strengthened in as well. And how if you do have your faith strengthened in these things, it's going to be a blessing to you. It's going to help you. Number one, Jesus wants us to believe that he is alive. Well, that was the number one thing he wanted to convince them of, that he was actually back from the dead. He wanted to convince them that he was actually alive. Now you say, why is that? Because the resurrection is the key to Christianity. Apart from the resurrection, it's not any different than any other religion in the world, mainly. But the resurrection is what makes Christianity different from every other religion in the world. Why? Because Every religion in the world begins with mankind reaching toward God. Do better, be better, try harder, get more karma. Eventually, maybe, hopefully, God might allow you into heaven, whatever that looks like, uh, if he's in a good mood. That's all religions in the world. The difference between Christianity, other than the resurrection, is that God did not ask us to reach to him He said that he began by reaching down to us. And so Jesus wanted them to believe that he is alive. Now, there's a mountain of evidence about the resurrection of Christ, and today's message is not about that. So just for sake of clarity and time's sake, we're going to just go forward. And the assumption that I have is that Jesus actually did resurrect from the grave, okay? Now, if you don't believe that, if you have questions about that, maybe you have friends that are confused about that, then uh, there are other resources that we'll use and other messages that can help you. But right now, we're going to assume that Jesus actually did die, get buried, and come back to life again. And I want to show you that the resurrection is what changes everything. We're going to read another passage in John chapter 20. It says, now Thomas, he was one of the 12, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So Jesus appeared to the disciples, but Thomas was not there, okay? I'm not sure where he was. The Bible doesn't say, but he wasn't with them at the time. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, see if this sounds familiar. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. You ever been to that point in your life? I don't care what you say. I'm just not going to believe. If God was really a God of, uh, of goodness and compassion and holiness, why does he let all this evil happen in the world? I will never believe that a God that allows that is a good God. How can you say that there is a God who loves us, who is a personal with us because my mother believed in him and she died at a young age of cancer. I will never believe. You ever been there? The truth is often because of our circumstances and our pain, 
and our doubts, we get in that case. We just simply don't believe. But I want you to see what happened to Thomas. What happened next? He, after he said, I will never believe. Eight days later. So we're not sure what day this was that Jesus appeared to them. But eight days after that. A week and a day. His disciples were inside again. And Thomas was with them. And although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Thank God he said that because I don't know about you, but if the doors are locked and everything is closed and all of a sudden a person appears, they didn't walk through the door, they didn't come down the chimney, they didn't crawl through a window, they just manifested right in front of you, I would need a little peace in my life as well. Might even need a diaper, I'm not sure, but nevertheless... The fact is, Jesus says, he appears to them, he says, peace be with you. And notice what he did. He said something to the very one that said, I'll never believe. Which tells me that God hasn't given up on you yet. Which gives me hope to believe that when I have doubt, when I have problems believing a certain thing, God doesn't give up on me so easily. I'm glad for that. But he says to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand out and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And I want you to notice what Thomas said to him. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. I'm going to explain what that means in just a minute. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about you. Those people that didn't physically witness the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ, but yet they believe. He says this changes everything in your life if you'll just believe. If you'll just believe that Jesus is alive. I believe that The resurrection enables you to believe that Jesus is God. I guess that's kind of a a thing that's a bit of an understatement, okay, or maybe it's an obvious thing, but let, let me just put it into perspective for you. If a man who claims to be God literally dies, I mean, he was whipped so badly and crucified that it would be impossible for him to live, and he was dead and put into a grave For three days, he was not embalmed. He was not treated to modern uh, stuff that we do with funerals and stuff nowadays. He was not mummified like the Egyptians did. But for three days, his body was left in the grave to rot. If that man gets up out of the grave, I'm throwing my lot in with that guy. The resurrection enables me to believe that Jesus is God. And if he's God, it enables me to believe that he is all powerful, that he saves, and that what he says is true. And this is how it applies to you. Yes, he's your God. Yes, he will save you when you believe. Yes, he's all powerful. But often, you know what we have problems doing? It's believing. Oh, we read what it says that he'll never leave us or forsake us. But in the darkness of night when you're alone, when people have left you, do you believe? When you go to the doctor and you've been hoping and praying that you don't get bad news and he comes in the room with a somber look on his face and says, I've got some bad news. You've got cancer. Do you believe? When you come home and your husband tells you that he doesn't love you anymore and he's leaving, you and the kids, do you believe? When even in an economy like what we have now where so many people are looking to hire people and you go into your job and you get a pink slip and you don't know how you're going to make it, do you believe? You see, when Jesus says that he will provide for us, he means it. When he says that he will never leave us or forsake us, 
He means it. When he tells us that he understands our weaknesses and our pains and knows every bit of rejection that we've ever experienced, and he feels it, and he knows what you're going through, he means it. And so here the question is for us is, what does the resurrection do when you believe that Jesus is actually alive and empowers you to believe that he means what he says? I want to explain to you what Thomas said, and this will help you a little bit to understand uh, how this relates when you believe that Jesus actually is alive, how it will change your life. When Thomas said, my Lord and my God, he was making a declaration of faith. And I'm going to get a little technical for about 60 seconds for you here, but you just hang on. The word Lord in Greek is the word kurios, kurios, not curious, but kurios actually is how you say that. And it means, here's what it means. One who is in charge, can I get an amen right there that God is in control, that God is in charge, that even when you don't know where the answers are going to come from, he's in charge. He knows. He knows the future. One who is in charge by virtue of ownership and possession and authority. Not, maybe that went over your head. Maybe you did not get that. But the Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul wrote this, that Jesus Christ, with his death on the cross, has purchased us with a price. And his price was his own blood, his own life. He purchased us. And and, in other words, by ownership, he has the right and the authority in your life. When Thomas said, my Lord, he was admitting that Jesus was in control. He was admitting that Jesus is God. He was admitting that Jesus truly had purchased him with his own death, burial, and resurrection. Man, what, a, what an admission to make. And then the word God in Greek is the word theos. And it means that God is a transcendent being. In other words, he's everywhere. He's over everything. He's above everything. He's in control of everything who exercises extraordinary control in human affairs and is responsible, listen, for bestowing unusual benefits. (laughs) If you really get what that means, you realize that what Jesus did on the cross was not for his benefit, but it was for your benefit, and it was for my benefit, and God is the one that that he just gives unusual benefits, like grace. When we get what we don't deserve, when God tells us you didn't earn it, you don't deserve it, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, when he gives us salvation, when he exchanges our sin for his righteousness, it is an unusual benefit that he bestows upon us. So when you believe in the resurrection, you're acknowledging that Jesus is greater than your pain, your sorrow, your circumstances, and your fear. That's what Thomas was doing. Yes, I I admit, God, you're in control. Yes, you're a transcendent being. Yes, you are Lord. But you know what Thomas had come to the conclusion of at that moment? By the way, he was in a lot of pain. For three and a half years, he had followed this man that said he was the Messiah. He was going to deliver Israel, but he was killed. He was murdered. He was in pain. I've wasted three and a half years of my life. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life now. I'm a grown man. What am I going to do? He was in pain. He was in sorrow. His circumstances certainly looked bleak. And one of the greatest emotions that these disciples faced, if you read these chapters, was fear. They were afraid for their life. They were afraid for their future. They were afraid for everything in their life. Have you ever been there? Don't know where your next paycheck is going to come from? Don't know how you're going to raise your kids? Don't know how you're going to survive all the stuff going on in the world. Is your life ever marked by fear? Well, Jesus in his his kindness and his love for 40 days, 
He hung around after his resurrection. You know what he wanted to convince the disciples of? He was alive. He actually resurrected. Because when we believe that, it changes everything. Now, here's the second thing I want you to see that he wanted them to believe. He wanted to convince them of. He wanted them to believe that he loved them. Do you know that every single one of the disciples rejected and neglected and denied Jesus at his trial? Every, these are the closest people to him. These are the people that he loved. These are the people that hung out with him for three and a half years. I mean, this was, this was no small thing, and every single one denied him. That is no little thing. First of all, it's one thing to deny, well, I'm really a Christian, or I really am sold out to God, or whatever. It's another, th- it's another thing completely to deny Jesus. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that for many of you in the room, maybe in some ways you've denied Jesus, but you didn't do it publicly. You didn't do what these guys did. Completely turned their back on Jesus. Every single one of them. And yet, one of the things that Jesus wanted to do was to convince them that he loved them. I I want you to notice in what we're going to read that the apostle John was the only one that was convinced that Jesus loved him. You say, where do you get that from? I actually get it from Scripture. And I don't have time to read every one of these things. But you need to understand that uh, the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are not written in a way that you could consider it fiction or a story or whatever. They're actually historical documents. And in this era, in this time, when a historical document was written, the person who was the author of that document would never name himself in the document. He would refer to himself as something else or in some other way. For example... In John's gospel, and it's the only gospel that records this, and it's the only disciple that it's recorded about, John constantly refers to himself as either the other disciple or mostly as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, I want to show you how significant that is. Because John chapter 20, verses Uh, 1 through 8, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance, and she ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. You know, I do sometimes let my mind kind of go, you know, these were guys that hung out, and they were guys, okay? These were not like super sophisticated guys. These were fishermen for the most part. And so you know there was a lot of joking going on. There was a lot of ribbing going on. There was a lot of one-upsmanship going on. I wonder sometimes, and I realize this is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but I wonder sometimes if John didn't write these things just to dig at Peter. Because I want you to notice that he said two things. He said, Peter came, and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, Peter, in case you're wondering, he loved me. And he said, they have found the Lord's body or taking the Lord's body out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid them or have put him. And Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb, and they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. If I, and I realize God didn't choose me to write scripture, okay, but if I had written that, I could not think of a better dig to put in at Peter. Uh, the young guy outran the slow old guy to the tomb. Peter, in case you're wondering, I outran you to the tomb. And he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. And then Simon Peter arrived and went inside, and he also noticed the linen wrappings wrappings, uh, lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Before I read this last verse... Do you know why that's significant? I mean, 
a resurrected body is not limited by time or space. It can go through walls. It can go through clothes. So when Jesus' body resurrected, he literally came through. He didn't unwind. He didn't find somebody to, hey, could you unwrap me? He literally just came right through those wrappings, those clothings that he was wrapped in. So why would he take the linen wrapping around his face and fold it? The, 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 the mummy garments, that's what it looked like, had just kind of collapsed and they were laying there without a body in it. Probably looked kind of strange. But then the face covering was folded and set aside so that it could be noticed that Jesus took the time to set it aside. I think what that means is this. Jesus was giving his disciples a message. I ain't finished yet. I'm not done with you yet. Do you remember what it was like when you were growing up? I remember this. On Sunday after church, we would go to my grandma's house almost every Sunday, and we'd have this feast. And, man, it was just a good old southern uh, artery-clogging feast. I mean, we had the best food in the world. And at the end of the meal, well, almost the end of the meal, when you got finished eating fried chicken and roast beef and roast pork and macaroni and cheese and country ham and biscuits and gravy and all the wonderful, wonderful food that they made, some kind of disgusting things called green beans. I don't know what those are about, but um, they had some of those as well. But you know what my grandma used to do, and this is, this is interesting, she said, y'all don't get rid of your napkin yet. You know why? Because dessert was getting ready to happen. And sometimes it was banana pudding, and sometimes it was peach cobbler, and sometimes it was blackberry cobbler, and sometimes it was cake, and sometimes I don't know what all it was, but it was so good that if you rubbed it on your forehead, your tongue would beat your brains out trying to get to it. I know how good it was. But you know what my grandmother was really saying? When she said, fold your, don't, just fold your napkins, hold on, we're not finished yet. You know what she was saying? Richie, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. And I believe that was the message that Jesus gave his disciples. They were suffering, they were full of sorrow and fear, and he just folded that napkin and put it aside. He said, boys, hold on. The best is yet to come. And ladies and gentlemen, I got to tell you, when you believe that Jesus loves you, when you believe what the Bible says about you that happens to you when you come into a, a loving relationship with Jesus Christ, God Almighty has a message for you. The best is yet to come. All that you suffer in this life, all the trials that you're going through right now, just hold on. The best is yet to come. And I believe that's what Jesus was doing. You see, knowing that Jesus loves you changes everything. And uh, our staff told me to do this. Sometimes I start crying when I'm thinking about all this stuff and it makes my nose run. And I got a nose. So. go. There we go. All right. Now I, spa I spared y'all something that sounded gross. All right. So I want you to think about this. When you know that Jesus loves you, it, affect, it, it affects everything in your life. It affects how you behave. It affects how you live. And I believe it affects the results in your life. I want you to give you an example. Did you know that John was the only disciple who was not martyred? And he was the only disciple that understood and knew that Jesus really loved him. I want you to listen to this. The Bible or tradition tells us that Matthew was killed with a sword. Philip was hung. Peter was crucified upside down. James the Lesser, the reason they call him the Lesser, it just simply meant he was younger. James the Lesser probably uh, was thrown from the temple and beaten to death. 
James the Great, or the Older, was beheaded. Simon the Zealot was crucified. Bartholomew was flayed to death with a whip. Thomas was stabbed with a spear. Thaddeus was killed with arrows. Andrew was whipped by seven soldiers and then crucified. And yet John lived to over 100 years old. You say, why is that? Well, they tried to kill him. Did you know that they had advertised and filled the Roman Colosseum? They were, they'd kill Christians all day. And they had advertised that they were going to kill John the Apostle. He was very famous at that point in his life. And the stadium was filled with people that were looking forward to seeing him. You know how they were going to kill him? And they had advertised this. They weren't just going to stab him or chop him with a sword. They were going to boil him alive in a vat of oil. I cannot imagine anything more painful than that. And they heated the oil, and the stadium was filled, and the cheers were loud, and they put him in the vat of oil. They pressed him down. And he got up out of that boiling vat of oil. And he began, he began to preach the gospel to those thousands of people that were in the Roman Colosseum. And thousands of people heard the gospel that probably had not heard it yet. And John, standing in that vat of oil, was not burned. He was not singed. He was not harmed at all. And they were so confounded by this. They did not know what to do with him because here's a man that you could not kill. You know what they did? They exiled him. It was the only thing they knew to do. They exiled him to the Isle of Patmos and it was while on the Isle of Patmos that he wrote the book of Revelation. Now, what am I saying? When you know that Jesus loves you, it changes everything. And here's the last thing. Jesus wanted his disciples to believe that he was alive. He wanted them to believe that he loved them. And, and one of the most important things that he wanted them to get was this. He wanted them to believe that he uses imperfect people. That he uses imperfect people. I told you that all of the disciples neglected Jesus and denied him. One in particular that did it, and he's very famous for it, was the Apostle Peter. Now, Peter was, I love this guy because he, he, was, an, he was an active person. He often acted before he thought. Sometimes he stuck his foot in his mouth. But I love this guy because he was bent toward action. And at the Last Supper, Jesus looked to the 12 at that time, and he says, every one of you is going to deny me. And Peter's like, No! I will not. And here's what he did. This is interesting. I don't know if he actually pointed or not, but he said, they may, but not me. Very boldly and audaciously claimed that he loved Jesus more than they did. They may, but not me. And Jesus looked at him, he said, Peter, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me not once, but three times. Peter's like, no, I will even die for you if that's what's necessary, but I will never, ever deny you. Well, we know the story. He did deny Jesus three times. And then after the resurrection, in John chapter 21, verse 15, Jesus had appeared to them they had caught a great, a miracle catch of fish. And Jesus, when they came ashore, had breakfast waiting on them. And pick up in verse 15. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? You know what he's talking about? The very ones that Peter said he loved Jesus more than the other disciples. Peter, do you love me more than these guys? Notice what he said. Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He didn't say he loved him more than those guys. And he said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? 
And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. And he said to him a third time, which I believe was to get Peter's attention to give him a message. The message was not that Jesus still loved him. He'd already gotten that. I want you to get this. The message that Jesus was telling Peter was, Peter, you still love me. Even after a colossal failure, you, you don't feel like it. I know how you feel, Peter. But I want you to know that I know that you still love me. And you may have blown it in the past you still love me. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything and you know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. This is so good. I got to blow my nose again. You guys just, uh, Let me say this. Jesus wants you to believe that you still love him in spite of your failure too. I wish I could tell you that I'd been all my Christian life without doing something that made me doubt my love for God, but I can't. There have been so many times in my life that I've failed. There there have been so many times that I've let the Lord down. I hate it. I've beat myself up over it. I've failed. So have you. There's not a person in this room that would not say the same thing. There have been so many times that I've sinned. There's been so many times that I've failed. But Jesus wants you to believe that you love him in spite of the times that you failed. That is the message that God uses imperfect people. Because if you're perfect, this doesn't apply to you. And if you're perfect, you don't need to be in this room. If you're perfect, you don't need to come to this church because Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. And we just know that no one is perfect and that everyone fails and that everyone sins. But God wants you to know that once you commit your life to him, that in spite of your failure, there are gonna be times you feel like beating yourself up And that is not a license to sin, but that is a license to receive the grace of God and to understand that God uses imperfect people in spite of our failures. And what God wants you to know, he wants you to believe that God is a God of second chances. And he wants you to believe that God forgives. Aren't you glad that God forgives? I am. And then Jesus, I believe, in trying to convince the disciples that he uses imperfect people. He wants you to believe that he's not finished with you yet. He is not finished with you yet. Let let me say that again. He's not finished with you yet. He's not finished with you yet. And yes, you may not be everything you ought to be, but thank God you're not what you used to be and you're not what you're going to be one day. God is not finished with you yet. And I'll tell you this. If you'll believe that Jesus is alive, if you'll believe that he loves you, and you'll believe that he uses imperfect people and he's not finished with you yet, there is nothing, listen, nothing that you can't accomplish for him. Nothing. God will use you greater than you ever thought possible. Why? Because he uses imperfect people. He uses imperfect people. And the message that Jesus gave loud and clear to Peter and the other disciples was that he's not finished with any of us yet. 
Heavenly Father, thank you that you're God of second chances and third chances and 200th chances. Thank you for your grace, your mercy, and your love. Before I finish, I wonder if anybody in the room would, there, there's two questions I want to ask today. Just keep your head bowed for a moment. What is God saying to you? Maybe there's somebody in the room today that would say, Pastor, um, I needed that today. I needed to be convinced that I believe Jesus is alive, but I needed to be convinced of his love for me, and I needed to be convinced that God's not finished with me yet, that he still uses imperfect people. And I want you to pray for me, that God would use me. Would you just raise your hand? Anybody like that in the room today? God bless you. My prayer is that God will reveal his love to you more and more, and that he'll use you greater than you ever thought possible. But then here's the last question I want to ask today. How many would say, Pastor, I'm not sure I'm saved. All of this, believing in Jesus, it's important, but I, I need to know that I know that I know that I'm saved. And I'm not trying to create doubt. I'm trying to create hope in your life. I wonder if you'd say, Pastor, I, I'm not sure, but I'd like to be. And if you'd like to be, you pray something like this. And understand, it's not a magical little prayer, but it's the act of faith that saves you. It's the act of believing that saves you. It's the act of trusting him that saves you. Jesus did all the work. You just got to believe. I wonder if you'd say something like this, a prayer like this, online or in the room. Dear Jesus, I believe you're the son of God, that you died on the cross, and I believe that you rose again. And I believe that you love me. And I believe that you'll use me in spite of my sin and my past, in spite of my imperfection. And I'm asking you to come into my life and save me right now in the name of Jesus. If you prayed that prayer online today, please click the button at the bottom that shows that you prayed to receive Christ. And there's, here's what I'm going to ask you to do in addition to that. Another step. I want you to fill out that next step card and put on there that you pray to receive Christ today. This will help us help you, okay? We're not going to bombard you with emails. We're not going to harass you. Uh, but we do want to help you get connected and take your next step. So please do those two things. If you're in the room today and you pray to receive Christ, I want you, with no one looking but me, to raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. Anybody in the room today, I pray to receive Christ. Thank you. I see your hand. I see your hand. You can put it down. Anybody else? Uh, I didn't raise my hand right then. I don't know if you saw me or not, but I'm praying to receive Jesus today. Or I did. I did. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to listen closely. I want you to make eye contact with me, those of you that raise your hand. There you go. Make eye contact with me. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. Here's what I'd like for you to do. Even if you've done this before, okay, I would like for you to take one of the next step cards, take it out of the seat pocket, your name on there and just check that you prayed to receive Christ today. You say, well, I'm not sure if I was saved or not. Well, that's the reason to do it, okay? Uh, if you were not sure before, if you were sure that you weren't, or if you're not sure, I want you to fill that out. And here's what I'm going to do. Right after the service, I'm going to stand in the blue carpet on the other side of this wall. I want you to bring that card and put it in my hand, okay? Or if you don't want to do it, if you're busy or whatever, drop it in the drop box on the way out. But will you do that? Everybody that raise your hand, will you do that? Do that for me today. God bless you. Heavenly Father, help us today uh, to take our next step for you. Thank you that you love us. Thank you for this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.